Hello there, bro stuff, and happy new year. Uh, this is bro stuff with Prophecy Insights, and today we're going to talk about uh, I uh, Genesis chapter 22 and uh, also cross-reference uh, for extra reading would be uh, Daniel chapter 9. And what I'm going to do is pair two stories together for you uh, where Abraham and Isaac were actually telling the story 2,000 years before it would happen of what the Messiah Jesus would do 2,000 years after uh, Abraham and Isaac. And that story, um, the two stories are eternally linked together. And I want to show you, walk you through just a little bit of the two stories and show you where the linkage is. And it's going to be amazing for you. Um, when I just started thinking of the two stories and in terms of what do they mean to us today, I was pleasantly surprised at all the word pictures and things that God gave us that show the planning of God thousands of years in advance. I mean, think about it. When God created the universe, the earth, stars, light, darkness, water, created us, everything, he already had fixed in his mind the whole plan of salvation. It was, all, it was already all put together uh, 7,000 years in advance or longer. And, and what I want you to get uh, at the end of all this, and I'll give you the punchline up front, what I want you to get out of this is if God pre-planned man's salvation and man's deliverance from sin and from death 7,000 years in advance, let's say, then what is it? for him to help you with an issue in your life. If, if our lives are like a blade of grass, like Isaiah said, that the sun shines on it and it fades away, that's our life. And, and to God, our lives are just in, in our minutes of time to him. Um, then it's nothing for the Lord to help you with a problem you're having or to help you with an issue. And so what I hope today does is it clearly sets your mind on the elements that God used to tell a story and how Jesus and his, uh, his uh, birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, how that to find Genesis chapter 22. And I've talked about this a little bit before, but I want to kind of amplify it and tie up some loose ends today. So let's go through the story of Abraham real quick and Isaac. So in Genesis chapter 22, God basically asks Abraham to sacrifice his own son. So what does the Lord tell him to do? To get ready for a, a, a trip, take wood with you, you know, basically take your knife, take your son and take a donkey and head over to Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah, just so you know, is today the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, Israel. Okay, that's Mount Moriah, the Temple Mount. Any wonder 
the religions of the world would love to have ownership over the Temple Mount because it means so much to God and it says so much. It's the place of deliverance. So let's continue with the story. So Abraham gets everything together, loads up the donkey, and him and Isaac go on their journey to Mount Moriah. Now they get there, and the time comes when Abraham's got to uh, take his son and go up the mountain. So what does he do? He leaves the donkey with a caretaker at the base of the mountain. And Abraham takes the wood and puts it on his son, Isaac. Are little bells starting to go off in your head? They should be right about now. You sh in your mind, it should start clicking. Wait, where have I heard this before? And so the wood is put on Isaac. Isaac has to bear that wood for his sacrifice. Isaac's going to be the sacrifice. He has to bear that wood up the mountain with his dad. Abraham prepares the wood, prepares his son, and uh, Isaac says, Hey, Dad, I can see as I look around, uh, we got the fire, we got the wood, you, I'm here with you, but where's the lamb? And Abraham says, son, don't worry about that. God will provide his own sacrifice. He'll provide us what we need. Now, I'm sure at this point, Isaac was probably going, I've never seen my dad do this before. And what could, what does this mean? What's going on? Now, when, when Abraham binds up his son and lays him on that wood, on the altar, I'm sure Isaac's mind just starts turning. I mean, at this time, Isaac is probably 16 years old, a young teenager. Um, and I'm sure Isaac is a little confused and concerned and wondering what the heck's going on. He loves his dad. He trusts his dad, no doubt. But this is very unusual for Isaac. All right, so we know the end of that story. The voice comes out of heaven. The angel of the Lord says to Abraham, stop, don't hurt the lad. And uh, then a lamb or a goat, uh, whatever, a ram rather, is caught in a thicket. And Abraham and Isaac sacrifice the ram to the Lord, a faith sacrifice. And so, you know, that's how that story ends. Okay, now let's look at what happened to Jesus. Let's look at the days of preparation. Um, you can find that in Leviticus. Uh, just put into your, your concordance search, uh, days of preparation. Leviticus is going to pop up. Um, I think it's 18 or 23 in Leviticus. It's going to pop up. Anyway, just search it out, days of preparation. It'll take you to that scripture. But here's what the days of preparation were. Um, when, a, when the Jews were getting ready for Passover, and I, I'm going to make this real simple. I'm not going to get into all the complicated dates and months and all that. Just give you the, the general outline. When a Jew, uh, a Jewish family, Jewish father would get ready for the Passover, he would go out into the field, find a lamb without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. And he would tell his children, to take that lamb and bring it into the home, into the living area in the home. The kids were charged with the responsibility of caring for that lamb, 
picking up after it, looking after it, um, keeping it clean. And they did that uh, for four days. Now, the reason the Lord had the Jewish families do this is they, the Lord wanted the kids to be have an attachment to the lamb. As you start to take care of something, you start to have feelings for it. And this, uh, when the lamb was slaughtered on Passover, uh, four days later, um, the kids would feel the pain of loss and, <clears throat> and understand that the innocent pay a price for our sin. And through the shedding of blood, there is forgiveness of sin. And so the kids had this real traumatic picture painted for them in their minds and hearts that when you sin, it's going to cost you something. And it costs your whole family something when you sin. It's just not you who it affects, but it affects everybody in the family unit, everybody around you. So God wanted to get all these messages into the hearts of the Jewish children. All right. Jesus now, let's fast forward to the Lord. He comes riding on Palm Sunday, the day of preparation. He is the Lamb of God. He's riding on what? A donkey. Who else used a donkey to prepare a sacrifice? Abraham and Isaac. So Jesus comes riding in on a donkey. Zechariah predicted it, the prophet. Abraham demonstrated it. And Jesus then goes into the temple, socializes with the people for the days of preparation for the four days, allows the people to hang out with him, to ask him questions, to get to know him. And the people start to have feelings for Jesus, just like the little kids did with the lamb. They start to get to know him. They start to talk and go, you know, this guy isn't all that bad. He's a pretty nice guy. What is, what's with him that I feel drawn to him? What, what's going on here? I'm sure all that was going through people's minds and their hearts because Jesus was a very dramatic individual, very dynamic individual. Let's not make any mistake about it. He was very dynamic. And P.S., yes, he was meek in, in like Moses was meek, but Jesus was very in your face. Just read the Gospels, how he talked to the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Jesus wasn't just meek and mild and just let people beat up on him and poor me and he would have a pity party. No, he was very strong in his personality and his character, but very loving and very kind and, and gentle as well. That's what meekness is all about, right? So here Jesus is with the people in the temple. The people are starting to get to know him and probably like him. And then after the four days of preparation are done, on Thursday, Jesus at the ninth hour at three o'clock in the afternoon, and that's, that's when Isaac was being prepared for the sacrifice on Mount Moriah 2,000 years earlier. Isaac was being prepared at the ninth hour on the altar Abraham built. Now Jesus, the son of the living God. Remember, God made an oath to Abraham and he said, I swear to you by my name that all the generations of the earth will be blessed because of you, Abraham. So Abraham was the, the trigger 
that started the road of Messiah to return. He was the trigger. And God swore by his own name that he would do this for Abraham. So now Jesus, God's only son, just like Abraham's only son was going to be sacrificed, only God said, don't, no, you won't do that to your son, but I will have to do it to mine because all the people of the earth will be blessed because of you, Abraham. So now God the Father has to allow his son to carry the wood on his back, his cross, up to Mount Moriah, Calvary, the Temple Mount of today. Jesus had to carry that wood on his back and bear that wood that would hold him, the innocent Lamb of God, on a cross. And God the Father had to sacrifice his son. Jesus comes in on a donkey, just like Abraham and Isaac. Jesus has to bear his own cross up to Mount Moriah, up to the altar, just like Abraham and Isaac. And God provides his own sacrifice for the sins of the world. This is the perfect planning of God in these two stories, and they tie in perfectly together. I mean, I get chills when I contemplate it. I just, oh, all over, it just is amazing. Jesus then is put on the cross, nails through each hand, nails in his feet. His blood is being shed on that cross. He's suffering the separation between him and his father, which he had never experienced in all eternity. His father turns his back on him. And Jesus forgives a criminal and says to him, you'll be in heaven this day. You'll be in paradise with me. And Jesus, the innocent lamb of God, takes away the sins of the world and, and basically fulfills John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would be saved and would be given that gift of eternal life. Now I want to ask you a question. You see how the two stories fit together? Abraham is foretelling by his obedience, he was foretelling what Jesus would do 2,000 years later. And Jesus was carrying out and being obedient to his father what had to be done so you and I could be saved. It's amazing when you see it that way. Again, the Old Testament the Old Testament tells, shows us God's character. Jesus in the New Testament defines the Old Testament. It's like a, a Bible a dictionary. The New Testament's a Bible dictionary for the Old Testament. The Old Testament's kind of commentary. The New Testament defines it and puts meat on the bones so we can see it in living color. So I want to ask you a question. If God could do all of this and plan out all of this, what can he do in your life? I mean, what's, what's 60, 70, 80, 90 years to God? It's minutes to God. <clears throat> Remember that scripture in Peter? Peter said, uh, and uh, it's also in Hosea. Uh, Peter said, a thousand years to the Lord is but a day. A day is but a thousand years. Translated, 
There's no time where God lives. And, and a thousand years to him is one of our days. One. So what can God do to help you in your life? Let me tell you what's in between God helping you and the solutions you're looking for. You. We. Me. We are in the way. See, what God wants is what Abraham did. Abraham was willing to obey God, even if it cost him his only son. And God wants us to be people where we're willing to do and surrender to God, no matter what. We're totally sold out for Jesus Christ. That's what God's looking for in our hearts. So the only thing standing between what God wants to do in our lives and what's actually happening is our hearts. And look, I'll be the first to confess. I'll be the first one to say that oftentimes I put up roadblocks and I put up walls and I say, God, no, 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 don't go there. That's too painful. Stop. That's it. That's all I can deal with. And I kind of turn the key off. And then the Lord, the Holy Spirit has to deal with me. I convict me and then I come to my senses and I, I remove the wall. I humble myself before the Lord and then the Lord digs deeper. And you know, we're all diamonds in the rough. We're a lump of coal when God gets a hold of us. And the only way you can turn coal into a diamond is by putting it in this, this tumbler. And it goes really fast. It spins really fast. And all the other diamonds are put in together. And they bump off of each other. And they knock all the rough edges off of one another. And then when it's all done, you got this brilliant diamond. This beautiful diamond, a lump of black coal turned into a beautiful diamond like a star in heaven. That's what we do for one another. That's why God doesn't want us to stop fellowshipping together, because we sharpen one another up and we help one another to grow. God wants you to grow. Say yes to Jesus. He doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to bless and help you. He, you know, look, we're all going to have to go through tough times. And it's only a matter of time before you experience something really difficult in your life. It will happen. I, I've lived long enough to be able to promise you this. Maybe your life is great right now, but something will happen in your life that's going to challenge the daylights out of you. And you're going to need God in your life. That's what these two stories show us. Obedience and surrendering ourselves to the Lord. And that God can cause great things to spring out of that humility, that obedience, and that surrender. So, there you go. You know, read Genesis 22, Daniel chapter 9, read Luke uh, chapters 2 through 4 over again about the birth of Jesus. And then <clears throat> you'll be able to see, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll be able to see clearly that your 2019 can be better than 2018 because Jesus is in your life. And it's just a matter of surrender. Just surrender. He, he doesn't want to hurt you. He wants to love you into growth. Now, some of the things God will have you experience will pressure you, will squeeze you beyond what you thought you could endure. But when you come out on the other end, you're more like Jesus. In every one of those situations, you're more like the Lord. So keep looking up. Jesus is coming back soon. I want to share 
the pairing of these two stories with you. I hope it encouraged you. It really blessed me. And I hope I communicated these two stories in a way that you could grasp it and that I didn't confuse you. So God bless you. I'll see you again soon. And remember, if you don't know Jesus, go to brosteph.com. Scroll down about three quarters of the way down the page. And right in the center, you'll see how to ask Christ into your life. And follow those steps there. And, and ask Jesus, start 2019 out with surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and starting your personal relationship with him today. Okay? And while you're at it, read Romans chapter 10. That'll walk you through asking the Lord into your life and the promise that when you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. This bro Steph over and out. See you on another Prophecy Insights. Blessings to all. Happy New Year. Bye for now.